you mentioned the 93 settlement as one of the, I suppose, one of the bones of contention that you initially had. Have you had any more, uh, do you know even more about what actually led to Jackson having to settle the 93 um, civil suits? And if you do, would you like to uh, explain to my viewers, please? Well, I, I certainly have talked to Tom Mesro a lot about that. In fact, mm -hmm. um, my relationship with Tom Mesro played a significant role in, I guess, my evolution on the entire case. Um, Tom and I actually got to know each other a little bit okay, uh, be because um, I had raised a, a totally different, similar case with him. And he, his response to that, I thought, was quite... Um, intelligent and and my interaction with him indicated to me that he was a good person a very smart guy i've always thought he was super yeah. smart um and obviously did a great job with michael jackson's defense but i i got the feeling that he was a an honest person i don't think too many people especially mm -hmm. celebrity lawyers are honest and look i i'll be the first to acknowledge that the the 93 settlement was obviously a mistake uh, I'm not suggesting that it was a good idea. What what really kind of shifted in my mind, one, was, first of all, the nature of the allegation had no real credibility. And so from a substance standpoint, it doesn't have that much impact on me. But, you know, we're living in a world where simplicity is so important. I mean, what you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to get it's hard to get beyond the the most obvious thing. And if you're if you're. If you're spending tens of millions of dollars uh, on a settlement, then that at some level means you must be guilty, right? Mm -hmm. To the average, to the average yeah, the person, person, the average person, that means you must be guilty. But what you what you must do is you must be able to understand the calculus that was involved regarding Michael Jackson at that time. He had an insane amount of money, so. That amount of money to him had nowhere near the same value that it would to you or me. Nowhere near. And number two, it wasn't a matter of how much money he was willing to pay to settle this thing. He, it was an issue of how much money was go he going to potentially lose going forward if he didn't sell, settle the, the, the allegation. So by settling the allegation, the theory was – Look, we put this aside, even though we know this is a, a BS allegation. If this is not a headache for us publicly, then you know we're going to make so much more money going forward that it'll pay for the settlement itself. These are this is my interpretation, okay. but that's but but I think that that's what the thinking was. And then then there's the issue of you know how the civil civil settlement would relate mm -hmm. to a criminal case mm -hmm. and. And, and and so it, when you think about it from the context of what the circumstances were at the time, it actually does make some sense. And again, I don't think it was the right move. I mean, I would never, uh, just on a principal standpoint, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, would I would never give a dime to someone who was making a false allegation against me. I would fight like hell against it. But I can understand how um th th that decision would would become to now there's been some i've never been able to fully understand what the insurance company's role in that was uh i've gotten kind of differing uh views on that so i, I don't okay. have a, i don't know for 100 percent uh, what the what the truth on that is because i as i said i've kind of heard differing uh, okay pers perspectives on that but it almost doesn't matter to me because <laughs> because i i understand why the settlement was made now and most importantly you know if we're going to talk about simplicity right if the if the anti michael jackson side is going to say he settled therefore he's guilty my response to that is let me i'll, I'll match your simplicity with here's the most famous and richest entertainer of his generation with access to thousands of kids and the ability to get away with it if this is what he was doing uh with incredible ease 
And you're telling me that to this day you only have four semi credible accusers when there's this much when there's this much money on the table? Mm -hmm. right, yes. right, right there, to me, that's game set match. There's no possible way that Michael Jackson, if he was a serial pedophile, only abused four people who all these years later after his death are willing to come forward and say, yeah, he did this. And by the way, I'm, I'm being generous with the number four. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Leaving Neverland, there are only two. Yeah. And, they're well, they were and, and they're doing Sorry. so. And they're doing they're doing so. Um, you know, I, I, as part of a literally a billion dollar lawsuit. Uh, and so they have a massive conflict of interest. And as I've already said, their statements completely contradict not just their actions. I mean, not just their words, mm -hmm. but their actions for decades after the alleged abuse. And so um, I don't believe that they were ever abused by Michael Jackson. And the court system has thrown out uh, effectively, at least at this point, their their claims. And so, yeah, they're uh, appealing again. Yes. But right. Right. But the but the reality is that leaving Neverland was based on, on a lie. And if you understand the basic facts and the logic of the case, it's it's very obvious that that's, that is, in fact, the truth. Here's here's thank you for that. Here's what I found out about the 93 settlement, because that really bothered me and it was very easy to assume that it was a case of we stand to lose a lot of money therefore just give them what they want and they'll and they'll go away now i don't know if you know that a journalist called mary fisher wrote an article in 1994 for gq basically laying out how the first allegation was an extortion a, a successful one I, I read that and I thought, I want to find out some more. What eventually transpired is that I discovered that actually before, the set, before Jackson settled in 1994, there was a negotiation going between Jackson and the boy's father, not the boy. There was, a, uh, there was negotiations for money. It was essentially, give me some money or I'm going to accuse you of molesting my son. Mm -hmm. Before the boy ever made any allegations, so there's taped conversations between the boy's father and the boy's stepfather, where the boy's father is essentially saying what he's going to do mm -hmm. if he doesn't get what he wants. Uh, I'll, I'll quote Roberti. Um, if I don't get what I want, it will be a massacre. What else could the father of an abused child want apart from justice? It will be a massacre if I don't get what I want. That has to have anybody thinking they have him on tape. They wrote a book. After, after the settlement, where essentially they're saying, had Michael Jackson um, paid the 20 million demanded of him, the case would have never even been in the public. Now, regarding the civil and, and, and criminal situation that you spoke about, I actually think they played him perfectly. Because like you said, they sued him civilly in, in, I think it was September or October 93. He actually refused to pay for nearly four or five months. At one point, they were willing to take a million and he refused. Then they were negotiating script writing deals. I mean, think about it, John. Who in their right mind would say, you abused my son, therefore let's negotiate a script writing deal. And this is all, this is, it's insane. This is all on tape, but they played him perfectly because what happened then is they sued him civilly. They then, um, refu the judge refused Used to delay the civil trial until criminal in investigations were complete. Jackson's team actually filed several motions to delay the civil trial because they, I think there's something called the 120 20 day rule, where uh, if it's a minor, they have to they have to have a trial within 120 days. And Jackson's team were essentially saying, hold the civil trial so we can defend ourselves in the criminal trial, and then it makes this, the civil trial redundant. Anyway, they refuse. And they also allowed the criminal prosecution access to Jackson's deposition, which have effectively would have given his defense away. So I think that more than anything was a problem. He was he was in a sort of like a legal cul-de-sac, if you like. If I don't settle, <clears throat> sorry, go on. No, I think I think you're right, and I, I actually think that the um, the deposition issue is is underrated because. Um, 
when you have the defendant's deposition in this situation, you mm-hmm. have him lo- locked into um, where and you know where he was at any particular time, and mm-hmm. then, and so you can then pick. I'm a, I'm yeah. a big believer. I'm a big believer in these cases that when and where something allegedly happened is everything. If you can't yes. tell me when and where it happened, then I'm inherently very suspicious. And so you once you have the the defendant's deposition, you can although with Michael Jackson it's probably more complex because he's so famous and and mm-hmm. so traveled all over the world and and his whereabouts are pretty well where pretty well known, but once you have that, then you can kind of reverse engineer your story to fit his mm-hmm. deposition. Yeah. And and it takes away the the biggest defense, or maybe the, at this point, the only defense a lot of uh, accu- accused people have is I wasn't there at that time yeah. and place. Yeah, and and so once you get Jackson on the record in a particular set of circumstances, it becomes far easier to construct your story in a way mm-hmm. where he can't defend himself. Yeah. So I think that's one of many, many, many problems. Absolutely, with this, with this, and again, I. I have already look. People can get into the details, and the details are important and interesting. But to me, in my mind, the settlement is already pretty much irrelevant. I, I went from being that the, the from being someone who thought that the settlement was everything to to now again in the big picture. How do you get around the fact that we have so few accusers, and that these mm-hmm. accusers are so lacking in credibility? If Michael Jackson, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. If Michael Jackson really was a serial pedophile, the number of accusers would be mm-hmm. far, far, yeah. far greater. And within that group, there would be some who had extraordinary credibility. There yes. would be some. There would be mm-hmm. some who wrote a journal, or you know, at least yeah, told something. their. So told their parents or told their friends mm-hmm. or or somehow got physical evidence. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I mean and, and this was a guy who was being targeted, uh, you know, by parents for money all yeah. the time. Yes. And so so the, the I guess the, the biggest myth in these kind of cases is, and I've seen it happen in other ones. I've, I've done a lot of work on the Penn State Joe Paterno, Jerry Sandusky case, mm-hmm. which has similarities. Um, the biggest myth, in my opinion, is that kids, especially heterosexual teenage boys, are not going to say anything to anybody <laughs> about being sexually abused yeah. on multiple occasions. And by the way, continue to go back to this person yeah. many, many, many times and never tell anybody and never think, you know, not only is this wrong. But I could get a crap load of money yeah. <laughs> if I come if I come forward. I mean, it's insane. I mean, what the media thinks, and this is where the media gets it not just wrong, but they get the a hundred percent opposite of the truth. They think that because someone is a respected figure in the community, and you're obviously Jackson, a global superstar, um, that somehow that gives them godlike powers to keep these people quiet. Yeah, when in more. fact, when in fact, it's the exact opposite. Mm. Because because they are famous and because they have money, or or they're associated with organizations that have money, there's actually a massive incentive to come forward to talk, with story, yes. to stories, whether they're true or not true. Mm. <laughs> uh, because it's, it, I mean, whether it's in the kids' interest or the parents' interest or, or guardian, whatever, someone's going to go, "Wow, this is going to work out very, very well for us." And so there's no possible, and if I, in, in fact, I, I mean, one of the many questions I'd love to ask Dan Reed is, so, so how is it that you do this film, you now have two accusers, the, you know, uh, Wade Robson and James Stavechuk, and not one other person comes forward. You get mm-hmm. worldwide publicity for this. In fact, it's implied in the film. It's yeah, implied that- in the film. That other people will come forward. Reed talked about doing a sequel, which has, has never happened and probably never will, uh, you know, because he was presuming that somehow all these years after Jackson's death, as if, 
As if it's a, the people he would have abused wouldn't have been aware that Jackson is dead. <laughs> or, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, you know they, 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 it's now safe to come forward. Why is it that nobody else came forward? Not one person. That's not possible under the narrative that, on which your film is based. It's not possible. I I think that he he was hoping that somebody else would jump on the money bandwagon. I, I think they probably they probably gambled that it seems so lucrative to make accusations because there were a lot of accusations in Jackson's lifetime that were so clearly false. I mean, there was a boy in Canada who had such detailed information about Neverland, but it turned out not only had he never been, he was being coached by another pedophile called Rodney Allen. So, so people already knew, like you said, that they could say anything about Michael Jackson, and then there was there was money involved. The, we know the media were paying people to make stuff up. So you are absolutely spot on. That how is it that all of a sudden nobody else has come forward? And I and I suspect the reason nobody else has come forward is they they probably thought, oh crap, there's so much scrutiny. We cannot get away. We thought we were going to get away with this. We thought we were going to tell this story. We thought there was going to be no objective scrutiny. Uh, Michael Jackson fans, I mean, wow. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable what they've done. But obviously, clearly, with journalists like yourself, like a Charles Thompson, who's also written extensively about this, I don't think they were expecting any pushback. That's what I think. I mean, I could be wrong. No? Um, look, I, I don't know. I, I think the pushback has been much better than I expected. And you're right. Mm -hmm. It's been all, it's yeah. all been, it's been driven by, by basically a couple different forces. The Michael Jackson fans are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I, I am in awe. Uh, and, and by the way, in 98% of the cases, it's not about their fandom for mm -hmm. Michael Jackson. They are very substance-based, mm -hmm. truth-oriented. They do not, you know, I'm used to dealing with cults, okay? I, I've dealt with some cults, cult-like behavior. And, you know, in cults, they, they jump on everything that they think favors their side, regardless of whether it's not it's true or not. Mm -hmm. I have not found that to be the case with Michael Jackson fans. Uh, they, uh, they are very fact-based, truth-based, substantive-based, and it's because of them that the counter- narrative to leaving neverland has gotten any traction at all charles thompson has done an amazing job uh taj jackson and the jackson family mm -hmm. has done a really good job of of pushing back tom mesro has also pushed back and and so um whether or not that was the reason why there weren't other allegations maybe maybe not i actually think it's a factor of one you got to remember anybody that would have been sexually abused by Michael Jackson under Dan Reed's narrative. Of course, his, he had to change his narrative because the facts of his film uh, didn't, didn't fit as far as the age and the timing of these allegations. The narrative of the film is that Michael Jackson liked these prepubescent boys, yes. but, then, but then James St. Chuck's <laughs> allegation doesn't make any sense unless he's 16 years old uh, where he's getting abused at the train station, which didn't exist mm -hmm. and leaving at, at, at the Neverland Ranch at that point. But anyway, his narrative is prepubescent boys. Well, you know, Michael Jackson's been dead for quite a while now. So anybody who was in that category, right, is is very much into adulthood at this point. Mm -hmm. And and presumably, I would submit if they were if they were really abused, they already would have come forward a long time ago. Yes. But but there's there's another factor with regard to Michael Jackson, which is in order to be a to have any semblance of evidence that you're abused by Michael Jackson, you have to prove that you had a relationship with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You have to have photographs or video or, or whatever. And while a lot of kids visited, you know, the Neverland ranch, Neverland, yes. there, there, there was, there, there were, it, that was a, that was a pretty isolated bubble. And so in other words, in order to get close enough to Michael Jackson to be abused, and by the way, I'm sure, I'm quite certain that after the the allegations started to roll in, he cut back mm -hmm. on those that were that had access to the Neverland Ranch. I mean, he, would he been, was hardly ever there. 
Right. Well, that's the other thing. He was hardly ever there. But but my point here, my point here is that the 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 pool of people that have proof of access to Michael Jackson um, and a time period when he wouldn't have been, you know, very much concerned about false allegations is pretty small. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, and I don't believe any of them were abused. So. You know, um, but even still, even under those circumstances, even I am shocked that there wasn't one person that thought, you know, this didn't really happen. But I have some pictures of me and Michael Jackson and, you know, this will be I'll get a lot of attention and I'll latch on to this lawsuit. that's a billion dollars plus. Who knows what might happen? Maybe it'll work out for me. Um, No one did that, which is which is amazing. And I have to say. The only explanation I can come up with is that the people that were in that category who could have made a false allegation have so much admiration and respect and love for Michael Jackson mm-hmm. that they couldn't bring themselves to do it. Well, Brett Bar- uh, but Brett Barnes is a great, a great, yeah. great example of that. I mean, yeah. he's 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 basically implicated in the movie for all intents yeah. and purposes. Yeah. Yes. For all intents and purposes, Dan Reed claims that Brett Barnes Barnes was abused mm-hmm. and um and Brett Barnes was as maintained that he was not abused. Um you know by by the way um uh, I, I um I posited a uh I've never talked about this publicly before but um I, I posited a strategy that Brett Barnes could entrap Dan Reed by by claiming falsely that he was accused mm-hmm. uh, by Michael Jackson and have Dan Reed jump all over that as he would have, and then come out and say, uh, no, it never happened. By the way, here's my, here's my tape that I made with the, the Jackson estate before I uh, did my okay. interview with Dan, with Dan Reed, uh, uh, planning to uh, expose him as a fraud by effectively doing a sting operation, um, that never that never happened. But I, uh, but it was an yeah, interesting yeah. idea that I think was thought about um, at least because I did raise it with some uh, interesting people, and um, I wish it would have happened because I know it would have worked. I guarantee you. Yeah, I, yeah, guar- I guarantee you that if Brett Barnes had told Dan Reed, "Hey, I want to talk to you." Uh, about my relationship with Michael Jackson and indicated that he was a victim, Dan Reed would have jumped all over that. And and by the way, while that plan, to my knowledge, never went anywhere, there was another um there was there was another group of people who were planning a sting of Dan Reed that was extraordinarily um involved and intricate and I thought almost ingenious. But I don't know. I don't know what happened with it because okay. they they asked for my advice, and I gave it to them, and I was quite impressed with what they were doing. But um, I don't know. I don't know if it ever went anywhere. It may, may have not gone anywhere. I don't. I don't know. But but the uh, hmm, the reality is the reality is that if Brett Barnes had had uh, ever talked to Dan Reed, he would have jumped on it a hundred percent and would have been fooled. Absolutely. Hook, line, and sinker, but again, but again, the guy puts Barnes in his movie, mm-hmm. implying he's a victim, and he has never ever done anything but be very defensive of Michael Jackson, even to this day. My life is needed. My life is needed. My life is needed.